this is Nan McKay, and I would like to introduce you today to Anastasia Lipsky. Anastasia is founder and CEO of Access Speakers, an organization that specializes in all kinds of marketing services, including brand, uh, marketing strategy, social media, and even books, people for speaking engagements and podcasts. So she's really busy. She's, <laughs> she's been a podcast guest on many shows and she even publishes a newsletter. So let's meet this all round marketing person. Anastasia, you've worked in the travel industry for several years, not just doing this marketing, but you have a background. You have a backstory. That even includes seaborne cruises. So do you have a story from traveling from those days? Okay, so are you wanting a, a, a personal story or a story and how it connects to what I do now with my podcast and speaker you can go any place anywhere I want. want. Okay, all right. <laughs> so uh, for you cruise lovers out there, I will also say that I, I worked at Royal Viking Line back in its heyday. So I was really blessed to work for both of those companies when they were in their prime. So Seaborne Cruise Line uh, actually was Warren Titus. Those of you who have been cruising for a long time know that he's a legend in the cruise industry. I had had the great pleasure of working with him in Royal Vi at Royal Viking Line, ended up having to quit because I moved, and then ultimately found myself in another another tourism company that no longer exists, but we were doing a, a lot of beautiful things, and mostly Mexico and other places in the world. But uh, when Seaborn Cruise Line was, was basically being founded, I remember the ads of Warren Titus in his tuxedo with his foot up on, you know, a, a pier, and I just thought, oh, I need to be back with that man. And one of my dear friends that I worked with at Royal Viking Line, had just started working there. So I got a job there working in reservations and pretty much just was in there in the towards the very beginning of it. So we helped create the company that it was. At that point, it was owned by one man, Atli Brinestad in, Nor in Norway. And so it was a very unique experience because we didn't have as much red tape as you often have when you're part of a corporation, right? So it was just a magical, magical time in San Francisco. We looked over Pier 35, could see the ships coming in. You know, we were up on like the 30th floor or something. It was just beautiful, beautiful time and uh, a, a big part of what I did. And then basically from there, ultimately, I, I ended up becoming involved in national accounts and, you know, more of the marketing aspect of those things. And then due to a pregnancy and wanting to work virtually and not be driving, commuting to San Francisco, I ended up working for Virtuoso. And Virtuoso back in the day was called API, um, Allied Personal Inc. And that's, it, Virtuoso is basically a consortium, for those that don't know about it, of the top luxury travel agencies in the world, really. And I had the great pleasure of working with them for many years and doing a lot of work with the international ground operators. So, in that process, both Seaborn and with the my time at, at Virtuoso, I did a lot of event work. So I would put on these lavish, lavish dinners all around the world um, and was known for a dinner that I put on at the Bellagio every year. Uh, we started in some other places, but ultimately Virtuoso started doing their weekly, I mean, their their Virtuoso Travel Week, they call it now, I believe. They started doing that at the Bellagio every year. And uh, this event was for these on sites, these uh, international ground operators. And it was huge. You know, we'd have eight, 900 people, and every table was decorated differently depending upon the country that was being represented by that international person that that was hosting it and it was just magnificent so the the detail that I had to go into with that was pretty significant with a lot of event work all along and then when I left tourism was <laughs> not not by choice it was 2008 and I had I had been wooed away to another company um, wasn't really jiving with that company. I had never been unemployed. So I ended my contract or, or you know, said I was not going to renew. And that was in April of 2008. So 
I would then like talk to the cruise line presidents that I knew and they'd say, oh, we'd hire you in a heartbeat, but we just laid 50 people off yesterday. So 2008 was not a good time to walk away from a job because tourism was slammed, absolutely slammed. So I spent two years, I sent out more than a thousand resumes, not finding work in tourism. And um, I ultimately did, but meanwhile, this, what I do now, came. And it's almost like, I feel like God was just directing me down this path the entire time because it was my event experience that helped me get a, a part-time job working for a social media company. And I didn't really intend to. It's just that I really dove into social media in 2008 and 2009 because, you know, other than sending out resumes, I had a little time on my hands. And I really got deep, deep, deep in Twitter in the very early days. In fact, I'm even part of a book, uh, The Twitch Hiker. I was involved in that whole social experiment in the early days. And um, there was a social media conference going on in my town. I wanted to go, but I was broke as a joke. And I reached out and said, hey, I've got all this event management experience. I'll help you, you know, put on your, your you know, event. And if you'll let me attend. And she's like, oh, girl, we need to have coffee. And so she hired me in the 11th hour, which was a good thing because she had never put on a conference before. So I was able to really help at the last minute. But I got involved in vetting speakers for the conference. So that was a new experience. So I had all this event planning. I had the vetting of, of speakers. So I know what it's like to be on the other end. And what you're looking for when you are hiring a speaker to come and speak to your event. And, and then ended up leaving that position and I ended up working for a sustainable farm. And that's a whole another crazy thing. But doing sales and marketing there, that quite didn't work out, even though she's still a dear friend. All my kids worked there. It was a family affair. My eldest daughter got married at the farm. Like it was it's a family thing. Um, but I then was unemployed again. And that woman who owned that farm contacted me and said, my business coach told me that I should be speaking to grow this business. I don't know where to begin. You know, you know everybody in town. This is when I was living in Petaluma where I spent most of my life. And she's like, I will pay you for every, every gig you can line up for me. Will you do this? And, you know, I'll do anything once, twice if I like it. I was unemployed. Why not? So I just started reaching out to Rotary Clubs. She was an amazing speaker, amazing. And it ended up being her number one marketing tool because all she was doing was talking about sustainable agriculture. People would be excited about it. They'd wanna know more about it. She would invite them to the farm. They'd do a tour of the farm. They would be so blown away that they then would become CSA members, Community Sustained Agriculture, where you get a weekly box of meats and vegetables. And that was like, you know, uh, maybe $150, $200 a week that these people were spending on this food. And this was her number one marketing tool because, because it's sample advertising, right? And speaking is like sample advertising because people get a taste for who you are and what you do. So it just took off. She started telling everybody about me, People were saying, you need to do this. There's nobody out there that books a, uh, people who speak for free to grow their business. If traditionally an agent books people who get paid at least $5,000 because they take their 20 to 30% commission out of that. Otherwise, there's no money in it. So if you're going to be booking people who speak for free, they're just doing it to, to generate influence, awareness, and clients by being out there speaking. They're, they're, it, the model doesn't work. So I just, this thing that came to me, I just started doing it. I found out I was really good at it. And I just charge my clients for every speaking engagement I booked them for. And then the other big shift in the world was March of 2020. And due to the pandemic, I pretty much lost my business because everything I booked was canceled. So I got to embrace the pivot word of 2020 and started booking my grounded speakers on podcasts. Podcasts. Podcasts always were and always will be virtual. So that's how my podcast booking business really started to grow. And it's actually even bigger now than the speaking part, just because there's so much to it. And even speakers know the value 
of podcast guesting as a means to get more speaking engagements. So even though they're back to speaking again and, and, and meeting with people, they're still doing the podcast guesting too. So that's a lot for me to just share, but this is kind of like the full circle of how it starts with tourism. You know, if you just pay attention to the things that are brought into your life, the experiences you have, you never know what those experiences are going to give you that's going to help you get that next thing. And, and this is my home. I think that's really an important point because you, you know, you could just set, have said, okay, I'm going to stay in this track. I'm always going to work for cruise companies, or you could have gone over here. I'm always going to work for your next event planning, or I'm always going to work in here. You kind of step back and think about, wait a minute, I've got a lot of experience. How does that experience all going to come together mm -hmm. to help me find that next thing for me? Isn't that what I'm hearing? Yes, yes, it is, with the one exception that I didn't really think it through. What I did was I, I walked through the doors that were opened. So, you know, I, I believe in a higher power. I believe, I believe God had a plan for me all along. So whether source, universe, whatever you want to call it, like for me, this was all these signs point to where I am right now. But I easily could have blocked any of it. If I had just said, no, no, I don't want to work for your social media company putting on events, you know, or no, I don't want to find speaking engagements for you. That's not something I've ever done before. That's not in my wheelhouse, you know, but I knew that anything that was being offered to me, there's a reason. And, and how often do we not, you know, like if this door is open and we don't walk through it. We don't at least dip our toes in to see if there's something there for us. And that's, I don't, I don't want to live with regrets. I don't, I don't want to have a, a time where I look back and think, oh, well, if I had jagged left instead of right, you know, what would that have been like? What would it have been like if I had said no to that sustainable farmer? I don't know. I guess I'd still be in tourism. And I love tourism. Don't get me wrong. Because I had gotten a job working for a um a company that put on uh, wine cruises. You know, I had gotten a job. I, I you know, I, I liked the work, but it wasn't fulfilling me anymore. And what I do now fulfills me because there's no one else out there doing what I do. Not the podcast bookings, yes, but the to be booking, to have your business focused on booking free speakers, and that is the core of your business just doesn't exist. The only other person that I knew that did it to that extent sadly shut down in COVID. So I, I feel I have a, a, a mission, if you will, because I'm helping all these, these business owners and coaches and authors and people who have a message to share. I mean, some of my, oh my gosh, some of my clients, the message that they have to share are life altering. And I get to be part of that because they want to get it out there. Not, they're not even necessarily looking for the paid speaking engagements. They'll take them. Don't get me wrong. If anybody <laughs> wants to go to my website and check out my clients and pay them to speak, I will gladly help them with that. But it's not the core of what they're doing. So I can help them get in front of more people because of what we do. And the black book that we've built over the years you know, I, I, I personally have booked over 1,500 speaking engagements, like you shared. Like, I, I have connections of people that trust me because I only bring them carefully vetted speakers. The podcast guesting, that's newer for us, but we're starting to build that black book with podcast hosts that they trust us, you know, such as yourself. Like, I've been able to book more than just myself on, on your show. So, which, thank you, by the way. <laughs> I so appreciate that. But we take great pride in how we work. It's very individualized. We don't we don't take a template and send it out to 6,000 uh, podcast hosts and say, hey, here's my speaker. You know, we review the show first. We make sure that it's a good fit. We have our client do that. We actually, like, listen to the podcast. <laughs> so that's a whole different thing that I just feel really good about this type of work that I do. And I feel like I'm, this is my contribution to society is getting these people out there so more people can hear those powerful messages. Well, 
as you said, uh, you find groups and podcasts. Mm -hmm. So how did you find us? Oh, goodness. You remember? I'll tell you. Hang on. Tell me. I think I can tell you. I think I can tell you pretty quickly. Right. Well, ah, she's no. it all the, down. the pressure is on. It's, it's probably okay. a spreadsheet. Let's see. Ah, okay. Here's how it goes. Here's how it goes. Because I, I keep I keep notes. I keep notes. I keep notes on everything. Copious notes. Okay. Because you did an interview with Sally Wagner, who is one of my clients. So okay. our clients. We're booking them to speak and to do podcasts, but organically, they're going to be invited by other people. So if they do a podcast with someone else or like that, we didn't book them. I still want to know about it or a group that they've spoken to. I still want to know about it because we put that on their profile on our site. So I found out that she had done this interview with you and I'm like, oh, I need to add that to the site. And then when I was adding it to the site, I thought, oh, I'm curious about this podcast house. Let me check it out. Then I started my due diligence. I do all the things that I look at to determine if I feel that that show is a good fit. I'm usually doing this on behalf of my clients. Every once in a while, I'm like, oh, I think I'd be a good fit too. <laughs> so I'll offer myself. But nine times out of 10, I'm just doing it on behalf of my clients. So that's where it started. And here, I'm going to toss a little tip out there for anyone who is using podcast guesting or speaking as a means to grow their business or get their message out there. It's very helpful to pay attention to anyone who is out there speaking in podcast guesting that you align with. If you find that person and you know that they are speaking to the same audience demographic that you are looking to get in front of, pay attention to where they have spoken. Pay attention to the podcast they, they, they've they been on. You know, so a person, if let's say if they really resonate with what Sally Wagner speaks on, which is, you know, um, mindset, moral, and mindset, you know, NLP, like all that. If someone really resonates with that and they want to get in front of audiences that are similar to what she speaks to, they can go and look to see where she has done, gone. And then they present themselves to those podcast hosts and their those uh, you know um, group interviews, you know meetings and things like that. One of the benefits of the podcast is you get to hear it. So I would recommend if a person does that, they listen to that interview that Sally did with that show that they'd like to be on. And when they're reaching out to that host, they reference it. I listened to episode 239 with Sally, you know Wagner on August in August of 2022 or whatever. I, I also speak on that, but I speak from a very different viewpoint. And I believe that my, my expertise would complement what Sally has already shared. Would you like to have me speak to your, your listeners? So that's the, this is all a part of the process of getting booked, is being personalized in your approach. And, and when you can reference a, a episode that you've actually listened listened to that number one tells the host that you actually listened because as a host I'm sure you get many people reaching out to you that have not put the time into it and they're not in alignment they're just like oh podcast 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 I'm going to pitch myself to all these places but when you know that someone's listened you know that they've taken the time that just kind of is like a little check mark ding they go towards the top so that's an important thing, but it also helps to explain why you are a really good fit for that particular show. That's important too. And then the host, of course, is going to vet you. Well, how does how do you even go about finding the groups? It seems like there's a lot of women's groups, for instance, in the country. And I remember back when I participated in a lot of those groups, and we were always looking for speakers. Yeah. For our yeah. meetings. So how do you go about finding your groups? Well, uh, I spent a lot. I, I, I think I missed my calling being an, an investigative journalist, for one thing, because it, you do need to get really creative. OK, now some of them is really obvious. OK, like the Rotary Clubs. You, you can start with that. Uh, we also continually ask, like when we when our speakers do a presentation, we have a, an evaluation form that we 
send to that group, that speaker chair, we ask them, you know, some basic things about them for testimonial, et cetera. One of the questions are, do you know of any groups or organizations that you feel that they would be a good fit for? So one of the best ways to get leads is from the people you've already talked to. So we do that, but I also to recommend every speaker always do that when you, when you are a podcast guest and and then you hopefully send a thank you note to the host after it's over always ask them do you know of any shows that you feel I'd be a great fit for I would appreciate any connections or referrals right so you get gigs if you will from gigs uh, a speaker even before you're off the stage end it with, I love sharing my message. Do you know of any groups or organizations I can get in front of? So you're doing that. So we do that too. Uh, we do just a lot of just Google searching. Also, once your radar is on it, I notice all of the place. It's kind of like when you decide that you want a red Volkswagen bug, then you see them all over the place, right? So, and there, there, there's a, there's a, there's a term. <laughs> yeah, there's actually somebody created a term. There is a term for it, and I forget what it's called, but it's the truth. And it's but it's it's because you have told your mind to put awareness on it. I have awareness on this. And so the thing the reality is we see thousands of things, images every moment of the day, but our mind gets to shuffle through what's important and what's not so now all of a sudden the red volkswagen bug is important and therefore we're going to notice it more chances are we had still had the same amount of red bugs going by us on a daily basis before we thought of it that we just didn't notice because it wasn't on our radar so i am like hyper radar to speaking opportunities and podcast shows. I see them all over the place. You could be, you know, in a line at a coffee shop and and hear people talking about the meeting that they were at last night and how great the speaker was, blah, blah, blah. Well, you go up to them and say, hey, I don't mean to eavesdrop. I just heard you talk about a great speaker. I'm curious what that group was. You know, you pay attention. It just pops up all over the place. So so there's a lot of that too. There's There's directories. Um, people have to very uh, oh speaker tunity. Uh, my dear friend uh, Jackie Lappin, she has an organization. Speaker tunity has a directory of leads, and and they're very good. Um, you can join. You had actually asked me about Innovation Women. Okay, I am a member of Innovation Women. It's innovationwomen.com. Amazing visibility platform for women speakers and a few good men. That's so, interesting because. Uh, they have contacted me, you know, when I put my information in to find out who they were, because you uh -huh. had told me about them. Yeah. And they have said, so what it, What do they do? Do they put you on uh, speaking engagements that pay and then they take their percentage? No, sure they are not. A, okay, so they're not an agency. Okay. Um, they kind of are a bureau. Okay, uh, but but not but not really, um, and yet kind of. So it's it's hard. They're they're they are a visibility platform. So you become a member. You're you're a woman speaker. You become a member of Innovation Women. They have calls for speakers, hundreds of calls for speakers that you can access every day in their site. You can do searches by keywords or whatever, depending upon what you want, what you speak on. Um, many of them are paid. Many of them are not. It just it, it it runs the gamut. So you can find leads by searching them on the site. You also are listed on their site. So there are event planners that are members. They're they're uh, you know business partners that are looking for speakers, and they might find you and can put a request through to you as a potential speaker for their meeting. Um, so that's that's the core part. But most of it is about education is about inspiration. They have a Friday Zoom meeting that is so worth attending. A person does not need to be a member to attend, uh, so they can go you know, for free if they want, but you might as well be a member because the visibility is off the hook. Uh, they are incredibly 
um, people that they, they, they flow through integrity. I mean, it's just a really amazing organization. They do webinars, they do all different types of trainings. Those weekly Zooms are just connecting with other speakers and we all learn from each other and that's powerful. We support each other, it's a community. Um, membership is only $110 a year. That is crazy. So I think it's a ministry to be completely honest. Uh, Bobby, Bobby Carlton, who owns it, she has a day job. She's got, she's got an amazing, hugely successful PR agency, Carlton PR. This is kind of just her passion. And it's just been such an incredible blessing. Now, she also has another company. Well, two more. She might have more than that. I don't know. She's Lioness Magazine, which is really great. I get a lot of content from there. And I get leads, by the way, for podcasts because they always choose a cool podcast to share about every week. Um, but it's a it's a beautiful platform for women speakers. So What's that's the Lioness name of it? It's, it's, it's called what? Lioness Magazine. Oh, so Lioness. A, like a lion. Yeah, okay. Exactly. So it's an online, online publication. Okay. Then she has myspeakerleads.com my speaker leads is all paid calls for speakers that i believe is about twenty dollars a month if a person's looking for paid do it for 20 bucks at least do it for a little bit you know my business mentor that you now are connected with katarina rando always says test it test it test it in everything in life just test it. So try it. Try my speaker leads. Try innovation. Women. I mean, I can't imagine anybody not getting incredible value from innovation women. Uh, try uh, getting the leads from speaker tunity that that Jackie Lappin offers. Like there's just there's so much out there. But the important thing is that you stick with what you resonate with. Because everything, it, you know, this is this is an energetic movement. Speaking, podcast guesting, this is why it's important that you always listen to a podcast before you promote yourself or even say yes if they reached out to you. You want to make sure that you jive with that host. When you're hearing them, do you connect with them? Do you like the way that they groove? If not, don't do the interview. Save them the time. Save you the time. Because people can feel it when they're listening if it's an awkward conversation. It needs to flow. So that's that's an important part of it. But yeah, lots of lots of opportunities to find engagements to speak and uh, you know, do podcast casting. I think this will be so helpful for so many people that can contact you and we'll talk about your contact and of course we'll put it on your on our website uh, but there's a lot of people that are starting to realize that if they're in business they really mm -hmm. should be a podcast guest on a number of places to get their name out there yeah I I highly recommend it uh, I know that some people have a brick and mortar business and so they might look at podcast guesting and think, wait a second, people are literally around the world hearing me. How are they going to come to my massage studio, right? Or whatever it might be. And that's true. That is true. It, it, and, and you want to really think, because it's important that we pay attention to our ROI, right? Our return on investment. Uh, and it's not just money, time. Time is valuable. Any time that we spend doing this marketing, if you will, could be spent generating income in what we do. So it does cost us to be part of a podcast. It costs us the time to find them, to promote ourselves, to do all this stuff, because if you're going to do it, by golly, do it right. Okay. Be sure. Oh, oh, wait, wait, hang on. I want to take a quick picture of us. <laughs> so I'm going to come back to that. Let me take a picture. So smile because I want to share this today. All right. So I'm going to do a um, a screen print. Hang on one second. So here we go. Okay. I'm going to share that later. All right. Let me put you back on gallery view. So I, can I should be better. doing that too. That is a oh, very good idea. idea. So you oh, can yeah. send me yours. How's that? Okay. I'll, I'll send you mine. Okay. So, so generally you want to make sure if you're going to use podcast guesting as a marketing strategy, please do it right and share it. So my typical way of promoting a podcast that I've been on is I do this. I take the picture and then I share the picture socially. 
Oh my gosh, I had a great conversation with Nan today. I can't wait until the podcast airs. Uh, meanwhile, you know, here's what we talked about. Meanwhile, here's a link to her her uh, website and her show. Check out some of her previous guests. And, and you know, if you like it, do her solid. Subscribe, rate, review her podcast, and I'll let you know when it's out. Okay, so it's something along those lines. It's, it takes a few minutes to share that. I will tag you. Uh, if a show has a page, like a business page or a, by the way, I only, I only do LinkedIn. So just letting you know, um, if they, if they have a business page for their podcast or for their business, I always like to tag their business page too, because this is all about giving visibility to the host, keeping in mind that what we as a guest, if we want to be the type of guest that a host will refer to other people, we need to get ourselves in the viewpoint of that podcast host and how can I bless them? And I will tell you, you know this, I'm speaking to the choir here, but podcast hosts want visibility. They want new listeners. Okay, they don't want to be talking to the same people day in and day out. They, they have their core people, their community, and that's important. They develop a relationship with them, but they want to expand. The way that they expand is by the guests that come on, introduce them to their spheres of influence, right? So they, they have that opportunity to get more exposure, and you're going to do that by sharing it socially. So I will share it like now saying, hey, it's coming when it's out then I will share it again and I will link to the actual episode. I will also add it to my profile on my site or if somebody has a, you know, a speaker page on their site and you're listing all the places that you've spoken and podcasts you've been on. Uh, one of the beautiful things about the digital aspect is that you can actually link to the recording. So instead of it just being the names of all the places you've spoken and the shows you've been on, make it a link. So people can actually hear you. You're getting more exposure to that host and to yourself. The backlink value of podcast guesting and promoting it is off the hook. And this all helps you get found. So what's going to happen is that you might have that brick and mortar business. But when people are Googling massage in their town or CPA in their town or whatever it might be, your rankings are going to come up higher because you've got all this Google juice out there because of you being on that podcast. The podcast host is sharing it. You're sharing it. You've got backlinks all over the place. You know, the show notes are going to be backlinks to your site. All of that is part of the strategy. So it's important that you do that aspect of it. If a person is just going to be on shows and do the interview and then the interview is over and they don't do anything else with it, it's, it's kind of like spitting in the wind. You might get a droplet that's going to land somewhere that of value, but mm, not so much. So do it right. I think you're absolutely right because I do – have some podcast guests that I think they're they think they're doing me a favor. I'm like, uh, <laughs> hey, I'm not making any money from this. So how are you doing yeah. a favor? I know, right? I gotta figure this one out. But they could do me a favor in a sense by uh, because I give them a full page marketing page, a wow. full right page write up on their for their marketing. Yeah, for free. Yeah. And, but what would be nice is if. We could trade something, and the trade might be exactly what you're talking about. You know, I have a yeah. question for you on the money end of it. You talk about some of the groups that you're talking about or some of the companies do it for free, free, and some of them are free bookings. In other words, you're not getting anything for it as the speaker. Right. And some do it for paid. Yes. But I keep wondering, so... If, for instance, I decided that I wanted to do this nationwide or worldwide or whatever, you know what kills you is your travel expenses, especially mm. today. Yes. I just can't. I was going to go down to um, visit my son in Phoenix, and it was like $1,600 a trip or some crazy wow. amount. Wow. Like yeah. What? So we've we've got a lot of high travel. Do you ever do they ever pay for the travel expenses, even though you don't get an honorarium or you don't get a fee? So in my company, no. 
and and therefore I am only booking local speakers. Local, okay. For for me, the groups that I work with are primarily in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, I when when everybody went virtual, that was that was awesome for a moment because then I was able to book out of state for many of my my yeah. clients. But they've many most of them have gone back to in person, and some of them are doing the hybrid, but. You know, unless you're like you've got a really strong tech team, hybrids generally don't work really, really well. So I try not to do that, you know, like Zoom in a speaker where they're trying to talk to people both on Zoom and in person. So it just yeah. Um, so but there, there, there are some ways around that. OK, well, first off, like some of my speakers, one of my speakers, my, my gal in New Orleans, it's amazing, um, amazing story. Oh. I've got to tell you about her. I think I might have. I can't remember. Anyway, it doesn't matter. I will. Um, she goes to San Francisco often. And so I will try to line up engagements for her when she's there. Sometimes I can, sometimes I can't, but I try. But but really, it's if you are a speaker and you are wanting to get out there and speak and you are speaking, say, to a conference and they don't have a budget. OK, but now you got your travel experience uh, expenses. And, and you, have by the way, always ask, will you cover my travel expenses? Because some of them will, you know, they they might still do that. They'll say, no, we don't have a budget. But when you say, hey, look, this is how much it's going to cost me to get to you. Is there any chance you can support me with this? You know, or do you have a sponsor for your conference that might help offset some of this cost? Um, th that's a possibility. And I want to throw one thing out there and then come right back to this. And the thing I want to throw out there is that if you are an author and you are speaking to a group that does not have a speaker budget, always ask them if they might have a materials budget or a marketing budget that will pay for every attendee to have one of your books. Hmm. Because they're pulling that from a different budget. And it's happened often that an author has at the very least been able to sell 300 of their books at the conference that they went to speak to. So, so just always keep that in mind because the materials and marketing budgets are separate from the speaker budget when the people are putting on a conference or a meeting. Okay, now back to the idea of sponsored speaking. So a sponsored speaking is when a company will pay a speaker to speak to a group or an organization or at a conference or cover their travel expenses or both in exchange for getting the visibility. So I'm gonna use Katerina as an example, okay? So she's a professional speaker on top of all the other things that she's done in her life. She speaks to women entrepreneurs, okay? Staples as a company knows that the audiences that she's speaking to buy office supplies because they're women entrepreneurs. So Staples would actually pay her to come in and speak to groups. Now, I believe that in her case, she actually did events that Staples was putting on. Maybe, maybe she did more of the traditional sponsoring, I don't know, but this is what happens is that you can have a speaker who is paid for by that company. I mean, I remember uh, seeing a man, uh, who, incredible guy from UCSF talking about uh, diabetes and he has a great books and things like that on it. Wells Fargo paid for him to speak. So Wells Fargo is all in all the literature you know, I think he made a brief mention, like, you know, thank you to Wells Fargo for, you know, uh, allowing me to be here to present to you, maybe say something at the end, you know, thank you, Wells Fargo. But he's not pitching anything about them. It's just that they're they're getting their visibility out there. And they knew that they were in front of a, 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 an audience that was going to be of value. He this was not an audience that was there to see him just talk about diabetes. This was a series of people that would come and see these very uh, high profile speakers, whatever their subject might be. So these were high profile people who were affluent and Wells Fargo wants them as clients. So it's a brilliant idea. So there's all kinds of things like maybe you speak on memory and you can tie yourself, align yourself with a company that, uh, you know, sells ginkgo biloba or whatever it's called. I don't know. You know, you get creative and or you get someone to help you who's really good at it. And that's where I'm going to talk about Julie Austin. So Julie Austin has a company called speakersponsor.com. 
She knows sponsor speaking better than anybody I know. And she would be a really great person to connect with because she has kind of like a bureau for sponsored speakers. She has incredible connections. She has a, a training that she's done. It's like an eight hour uh, on demand training that you can purchase. And she literally dumped everything she knows about the business into that training. You can do one on one training, but she can help people understand how to get sponsored to speak. That's so that's that's what she does. So, yeah, so that's that's just one more way that you can, you know, find that those travel expenses get paid. OK, the conference, you tried, you tried, you tried. You really want to do this. Then you find a company that's in alignment and, and they want to get their name in front of those people. You've just you you are a font of information. Thank you, thank you. I love yeah, sharing. I think so it. many people will find this so helpful. Um, let's talk about your thriving women in business. Now you hold events, I think, on thriving women in business. So tell us a little bit about that site. Okay, so that actually is not me. That's Katarina Rando's site. Thriving Women in Business Community is what she has created of all these various women speakers and things like that. So she she has, a, a, among many things that you can do, she has a, a site where you can list your events and the, anything that you're doing. If you've got a, a workshop that you're doing, or um, in my case, what I'm sharing on there is my monthly Q&A that I do. So on the third Thursday of every month at 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern, people come in for one hour and we just talk about anything they want. I answer any questions that they might have uh, related to speaking and or podcast guesting. So it's a real fun q and It's totally free. I love it. People love it when they come. Come. It'd be fun to have you there. It'd be awesome. So that is something that I do. And then I share about that on her site. And then they keep it on the site and they include it in their newsletters and they promote it on my behalf on social media and things like that. It's one of the benefits of being a member of her community. So that's what that is. So it's not me, it's them. And then I also, I had a women's book club, a virtual book club that I was doing and I had stopped it, but I'm starting it again in January. Once that starts up again, I'll also have them uh, list that on their site and share about it. So. And then. For authors, can you would you review their book possibly on your book club? You know, interestingly enough, I I have actually had authors in our like actually come to the book club. So we read the book, and then the author was there. So we got to do like a Q and A with the author. I've done that actually quite a few times, which is absolutely wonderful. Um, when I read a book that I really 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 love I always do a book review because a book review is like gold to an author it's how you are seen um you know you were talking about significance earlier not not people don't know we, we had a brief conversation before we started this recording about significance and and to me like uh, having reviews is part of showing the significance the value of your work is important. It's important for you as a podcast host. I'm, I'm going to say this right now to all your listeners. Anyone who is hearing me speak right now with Nan, if you are enjoying this podcast episode and any others, do Nan a favor. Do her a, a solid. It takes five minutes to go to Apple Podcasts and do a review. At the very least, click on the five stars. But take just a few minutes and write a review because it helps her gain her visibility, be seen as more significant in the podcasting world, and it helps her with more visibility. It's just it, it's just the way that this digital world works. So these, I will do author reviews. Um, the thing is that I don't choose the books. So we, we put them in front of the book club and, and then the women, they select what books we're going to actually do but if it's if they select a book and that author wants to come in we love it we always love having them there for the discussion and then i always when i read a book will always do a review afterwards if i in particular if i have a personal connection to that person so anastasia if they want someone that's listening or viewing this wants to know how in the world do i get access to her book club how do i get on this q a how do they do that with you 
the easiest thing is just to go to one page that I have designated specifically for this purpose. It is accessspeakers.biz. That's my website slash thank you. And if you go in there, then you will see my, my LinkedIn profile. You'll have a link to my monthly Q&A. Um, I believe I talk about my consulting services because that's another huge part of what I do is that all this stuff that I've just shared with you, these things, I, I work with people one-on-one -on -one in my consulting practice via Zoom. I record the whole thing because I do a brain dump. And we talk about their business, how they're showing up. I look at their LinkedIn profile. I look at their speaker one sheet. I look at their speaker page on their site. I look at their LinkedIn, or their uh, email signature. And we talk about their branding. Like, are you really showing up? as a professional speaker and or podcast guest, because if not, here are these things that you can do. So I do offer anyone who is interested, they can come in for a 15 to 20 minute free consultation with me, a little mini consultation, and they can reach me through that page. And I can guarantee anybody in a 15 to 20 minute conversation, I will find at least one to two to three things that they can upgrade in how their presence is right now as a speaker or podcast guest. So that's that's the, the primary part of this just, you know, so I've got the podcast booking, speaker bookings and the consulting. Um, that's all kind of linked to in this one page. So I kind of, I like to make it easy and I'm sharing this in more detail than usual because I'm talking to a podcast host and I'm talking to people who might consider podcast guesting and speaking themselves. And I want to suggest to you that you have one page and it's a dedicated page that has all your information there. And even a message that, that is, you know, if you have an offer, whatever that might be, uh, when people uh, go into that page, they can also get my free ebook. Uh, you know, all those things is just in one space instead of saying, well, they can find me here. They can find me there, blah, blah, blah. So I'm taking longer than normal to share this because I want to, I'm, I'm like in this infinity mirror right now, trying to explain what a person would want to do if they were on a podcast. So you just have this dedicated page and you have all your content right there and make it easy. Well, you really have a lot of information. I mean, I didn't even know there was such thing as a, a one sheet until I started talking about to Katerina, and then I saw yours, and actually, I loved yours. Thank you. And I asked my person in Can, can you go into Canva and do something kind of like this? <laughs> because I love yours. Yes, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Well, let me tell you something. If you do a consultation with me, I could actually help you with specifics on that, and you could even have your gal there with us, or you can get the recording to her, and then and then she can learn. Because here's the thing. I know people who have hired marketing and branding experts, but they're not from the speaking world. Yeah. So they miss things. I'm an agent. I know what it takes to get booked. So I look at people's you know, content all the time and it's beautiful. I love it. But they don't, it, they're, they're promoting their business, not them as a speaker, or they forget their content. Contact information, heaven forbid, sounds like oh. you would think it would be on there, but in their mindset, they're like, oh, no, because it's always attached to an email. No, it gets separated from the email, especially if you've got a committee that needs to consider the speaker. Like, there's so many things that get missed. So when somebody is spending that much money and they don't get it right, that's a crime. They don't have to spend a lot of money to do one hour with me and have me help them get it right, if you will. So so do consider that because, you know, I, I do give incredible value. I've never done a consultation that someone didn't say, holy Toledo, this is amazing. I believe so, that. I believe yeah. that. And, and I, I, it's what I love doing. It's the what I love doing. How I can do this. Yeah, good. I would love get that. I would you. love that. It'd be my honor. So what should somebody avoid uh, not to be blacklisted by event planners or podcast producers. Oh, oh my gosh. Well, just not being that diva that you're, you're thinking it's the mindset of you're doing them a favor. Mm, no, <laughs> no, no, that's not the mindset to have. Um, the, the, to avoid is to not share about it. I think more than anything else, 
Uh, and and if you if you don't get them, you know, don't make sure you get them the content. If they ask you for your bio and your headshot, by golly, just get it to them. Don't make them have to ask you three times. They're busy people. I know. I know you're busy. Like you know, uh, the, the the person who is submitting their their proposal to be considered as a guest. I get that you're busy. I'm busy too. But it's it's just really bad form to make anybody ask for something more than once. So get them what they want. Get it to them on time. Show up on time. Be ready. Be prepared. Be gracious. Share it all over the place. Share about it. Do a review yourself of the show. You know, I do. I will always do a review of every podcast I've ever been on because it's important. So, you know, it's that golden rule. Just treat yourself as you wish to be treated. So it's like, what, if I were a podcast host, what would I want? If I was a speaker chair, what would I want? And and those, I think, are the most important things. It's just be a giver. Yeah. Let's switch over to you, personally. Okay. You. Yeah. Um, so I want to ask a question. What do you, if I said what do you most want out of life mm. like today what do you most want out of life in your current who you are today i would say what i most want is my children and my grandchildren to be happy and to know that they have control over their happiness it's not the external circumstances that governs how we feel about life because it, it, especially given everything that's going on in the world right now, this is a really hard time for many of us. And, and, and we can, we can let that, we can absolutely let that be what governs how we show up every day, you know, or we can choose, we can choose to find that joy and find that happiness, no matter what's going on. Uh, Victor Frankl's book, uh, you know, um, man's meaning oh my gosh the meaning of no not the meaning of life I think that's Monty Python um man's search for meaning I think I can't remember Victor Frankl okay amazing amazing man wrote an incredible book uh, about his time in a concentration camp and you, you know you can't think of any I can't think of anything worse than that myself but that experience of of coming to the choice that man has choice they can take everything from you but they cannot take your free will, your your spirit, your heart. You know, they, they, they that's you. You get to choose that every day. And I want my children and my grandchildren to have this so deeply imprinted in them that no matter what happens, that they can always find that joy, that they can always find that gratitude, even if it's a feeling of that in the midst of tears. That that would be my greatest wish in life. And that makes a person, I think, feel valued and alive if they can do that. What what makes you feel significant? Oh, my children and my grandchildren, I think, you know, I mean, I, I do feel significant in my work because of the feedback that I get from people and I know that I'm making a difference in their lives because that's that to me, that's it. Significance to me is, am I making a difference? And I know that I'm making a difference in what I do professionally. I also know that I'm making a difference in the lives of my children, my grandchildren. Um, I, I, I didn't ever know any of my grandparents because they were dead before I was born. And I have a really deep connection with my three granddaughters, um, hoping more will be coming, but not from that family, hopefully <laughs> from some of my other kids, three's enough. But yeah, I, I just, I, I want to be that, that, um, that legacy, if you will. And I think it does tie into the joy. I do a lot of fun things. They know that they call me Marmy and they know that I'm really silly um, you know, I, I, I wear a driving tiara, by the way, all the time in my car. I get I get tiaras from Katarina every time I do one of her vampire events. So I've got a collection of them. So I have I have more than one in my car. So my 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 guests can wear a tiara as well. And I you know, one of the gals at my gym said she actually saw me and one of my granddaughters in the car wearing our tiaras. And she said it made her laugh so hard and brought such joy to her life just seeing us. 
you know, just seeing us. So these are the types of memories that I want to create with my grandchildren that that helps me be significant and be a significant part of their lives. That it's it's there, it, there's this deep connection that they have and that they'll always remember me by that. That is wonderful. Now think about just today. Can you think of just one thing and that it could be a tiny little thing, one thing that you are grateful for today? Today that actually happened today or what I'm grateful for today that might have happened recently? Could have been either one. Okay. Um, I would say, you know, something that I'm still grateful for every day that just happened a couple of weeks ago still is so fresh for me that I think about it every single day um, is that my, my son almost died. And he and his girlfriend are living with me just temporarily. They're not really living with me. They're just staying on my hide bed They had a place. They moved to town. They had a place. It fell through. So then it's like, oh, my gosh. You know, in the meantime, just stay here on my couch and, and something will work out. And they're moving out on Thursday. Hallelujah. So they were they they were sleeping on my hide bed I'm in a tiny little apartment. Very, very, very tiny little apartment. And um, and he he's a type 1 diabetic. And he had a low blood sugar uh, that was so low we couldn't revive him. Um, like he, I mean, he was he was kind of out of it. But no, he was very out of it. He was still alive at the time, but I I couldn't, you know, like I literally was on the height of bed trying to check his blood sugar. Couldn't. He was cold. He was sweaty. And then I'm like, call the paramedics, and the paramedics are coming. Of course, there's stuff all over the place. And his glucagon pen, which would have given him the glucose to save him, is packed because it was only a temporary thing. And who thinks we've never needed the glucagon pen before? All these things that could have gone wrong were starting to go wrong. He was seizing up. I literally was had my fingers in his mouth, putting honey on his gums and, and shaking him and praying to the Lord to please save my son as he started seizing. Like I could see his eyes, his eyes were clear, but they were vacant, like nothing was happening. And he just started seizing and he was dying. He was dying. Um, it was awful. <laughs> uh, this is not the first time I've always had a, a child die. And it the, 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 the trauma, the, the fear that, that goes through you. And yet all you could do is get in that action mode. What do I need to do to try to save him? And the paramedics were able to climb over everything and give him an emergency IV and get glucose sugar into his body and revive him. If they had been, I'm going to guess 10 minutes later, he would be gone. There's, there's no doubt in my mind, he was going, uh, his blood sugars were below 20 uh, their their machine doesn't register below that. They just know that, that it was below it. And for for people, you know, normally like a perfect blood sugar would be about 100. Um, this can and does kill you. It also can give you permanent uh, brain damage. So um, he lived. He lived. And and I am still in this space of incredible gratefulness because of all the things that could have gone wrong. His girlfriend just before the, her current job was had a job that she was working until three o'clock in the morning. This happened at 2.15. She wouldn't have been in bed with him. If she did not alert me, if she did not notice, he would be gone because I would never have known. He was not able to wake himself up out of it. So that could have gone wrong. The paramedics could have been later. They were really fast, really fast. Um, like just so many things. That definitely could have gone wrong. It, it, they could have, it could have been too late. Like even what they gave him, it might have been too late. He could have had brain damage. He didn't. So I look at all those things. Like all, just sometimes it's so easy to look at all the things that did go wrong. You know, like them being there with all the stuff and not having his glucagon pen. Like all those things, those went wrong. But at the end of the day, more things went right than wrong. So. I am still grateful for that every day. I don't think there's anything more frightening than to think about your children or even your grandchildren being in crisis mode and could die. Mm -hmm. I mean, 
that there's it nothing is, that probably yeah. would impact you more. Well, maybe a spouse, but I mean, well, I think what would impact me more is if they died. Well, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah. I guess that's the obvious. <laughs> yeah. That's the obvious <laughs> because I do know, I do know many people who have lost their children. Um, in fact, one of my former clients speaks on that. She has her whole business is around helping people with grief uh, because she did, she did lose multiple children. Um, so for me though, yeah, I've actually been through this multiple times. Um, not that situation, but uh, th three other times where I almost lost a child and, and it is, it, it just it just rocks your world um they because we're, we're they're not supposed to die like like we're supposed to go before them right? right what was that steel magnolias i think sally field had this heartbreaking talk i feel like I, it was at the gravesite of her son i mean her daughter after she died and it was just this whole gut-wrenching you know i'm supposed to go before you you know this doesn't feel like it's part of of nature and yet it is and yet it is, and and we get to look at that. That we don't have control over what happens. We do we do what we can, and we have to, you know, we get to live our lives in active surrender. We do what we can, but we accept what what comes, because we only have so much control. Yeah, so much control. So um, yeah, it's. It's not fun, but I still, I feel so blessed because I haven't lost children. Yeah. And it's something to be very grateful for. Yeah. Yeah, my, it is. My uh, daughter had an episode where she almost died. Um, and that's really a great part of the reason why I moved up to this area so I could be closer to her. You know, wow. she's fine now. She's got a pacemaker, but it was... I, I happened to be in Buenos Aires at the time, could not get there. Oh, and man, that it would is, be awful. It is horrible. <gasps> it is horrible. Really frightening. Oh, that would be awful. Yeah, you know what? That would be awful. Not being, okay, so there's the trauma of being there and experiencing it, but to not be there, way worse. Yeah. <laughs> I think way worse. And I, I'm so blessed that I was literally with each of my children when these things happened yeah and and i like i moved up here i mean like we, we are we my family we're close we're well <laughs> like i said my son's right right next door um you know in the other room because of this current situation um my other daughter lives four doors down in the same apartment complex and my other daughter's just 20 minutes away and that's where all my granddaughters are so we if they move to timbuktu i'm moving yeah like yeah. that family is my life that's that's my priority so yeah i wish my son lived closer but at least i'm close to my daughter so that yeah i'm glad to hear that i'm really glad to hear well, that. we have covered so much ground oh my gosh today. yeah <laughs> <laughs> what do you have any takeaways that you'd like to give us you know i think the, the main thing i just want to share with people is that if you've got a message you know use your voice Whatever it may be, if it's something that can tie into business, great, because that's, you know, primarily what I do. But even if it's not tied into business, maybe you have a personal story, uh, just anything that can bless people, do it. Get out there. Use your voice. It's a gift from God to be able to share, you know, and even if someone doesn't literally have a voice, they can write that story. Like get your message out there, whatever it might be, because if you hold in something that can change a person's life, you are doing them a disservice. So we want to always give to others and share our voices and share our passion and our messages because we just never know whose life is going to be changed because of what they heard. Well, Anastasia, I think you've probably changed some lives even today oh, with your presence. Thank you. So thank, thank you so much for being with us. I so appreciate it.